Boardroom Bound, episode 163, Uncovering and Relaying Your Value Propositions for Boardroom Excellence with Daria Torres. Have clarity on, number one, what you're bringing to the table um, and, and be able to tell that story in a way that is not just compelling, but that's relatable given uh, who you're sitting across from, right? So looking at ways to connect in that way. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Colonel Herman Bowles. Colonel Herman Bull started out with a dozen years successful track record in the Army and transitioned over into civilian life and now has an unbelievable portfolio of board roles. Some big public company boards where he is chair, vice chair, board member of so many organizations, including leading nonprofits as well. He's going to pull back the curtain, reveal how those came about and the lessons that we can all take forward in order to find the right board opportunities for ourselves. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about director certification. Want to join your first board, or are you looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach. Now through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Coaching and Certification course, you get both modern board director candidate packaging and modern board operations knowledge integrated within one program. Remember, the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized International Board Director Competency designation upon course completion. It's designed for individuals and groups. You can learn more at bit.ly slash IBDC dash D. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IBC DC dash D. And now let's jump into the show. Daria Torres, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you so much, Alexander. Delighted to have you on the show today, especially whenever I can have a, a fellow alumni of the world's best business school. That, that's Wharton for anyone who's uncertain listening to the show on it. I know it's going to be a good episode, and uh, I'm excited. So this is a, a ref, ref, reference from our f- mutual friend, Beth Albright, who gave a great episode before this saying, Daria is going to have a wonderful story to share with your audience, because many of the people that we've had on the show sometimes have had that typical path. People say typical of, you know, you be a CEO, be a CFO, be a president. That's how you land in the board space. But that's not everyone's path. That's not the only way to do it. And so many people come from different backgrounds who have great experience to be on a board. And I'm glad to showcase your story today, but I get so excited. I want to jump right into it. Let me pause there. Let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about some of your career before the board stuff started started to frame it up correctly. Sure, for sure. Uh, Well, since uh, 2004, I have run my consulting firm, Wall Torres Group, and, uh, you know, our mission is to facilitate positive change in organizations that aspire to excellence. Uh, we work across sectors, and I personally have had the pleasure of advising and counseling hundreds of uh, C-suite executives, board directors, trustees, uh, university administrators, and also founders. So uh, prior to uh, Walls Torres Group, it's probably important to also mention I was an engagement manager at the consulting firm McKinsey & Company. Uh, and before that, a systems engineer at Lockheed Martin. Uh, so dealing with the kinds of complexities that are being confronted uh, at the upper echelons of leadership and at the board level is kind of baked into my DNA, I would say. Is that helpful? And in it is great, and I think it's important for the audience to also frame and understand that this is not just something you do with your, your day business, but it's also something you're teaching at Wharton. You're part of the leadership and the communications class, education cohort, leadership group. Um, it's one of those things where you have that reputation to precede you, and I imagine this is almost teeing up to some extent how you got into the board space, because I know we get some of the questions from our audience of how do I become a person of a certain reputation, right? How do I get the person who's invited to speak at conferences or to be on the panels or to be writing books? or to quote it in the newspapers and the articles. And I imagine some of that has been a big part of the reputation you've built just by over time of doing good work. Can you sort of comment on that generally before we start thinking about perhaps more specifically networking for a board? Sure. 
Sure, sure. Well, you know, over the past two decades, it's it's been my observation that there is this um, inextricable interplay uh, between strategy, leadership, and governance. And, you know, in all the roles that you've just highlighted, whether it be serving clients, whether it be uh, working with students, professional level students in the Wharton's Executive MBA program or other uh, similar venues, um, it, there is an opportunity to bring to bear this kind of these kinds of connections and to advance thought leadership around them. And so I do think, to your point, that uh, these, let's call it three legs of the stool, strategy, leadership, and governance, you have an opportunity to showcase your uh, competency, your uh, insights, your potential, and along with that does come you know, brand and reputational value, both from an individual standpoint and as an organization. And so whether it be as a speaker or having opportunities like we have today, where you've uh, generously invited me to have this conversation with you, um, y- you know, you're constantly thinking about how to provide thought leadership and add value uh, to those who may be listening uh, and care about the topics that, you know, that, that are coming up. And maybe that's a perfect bridge to the next part, the, the value add, right? But when I think about someone who wants to be on a board, I get the conversation a lot. How do I get land a board seat? I'm saying, well, that, that's not telling me anything. It's like saying, how do I get a job? I don't even understand what that means. What what sector do you want to be? What size company? In? Give me some sure. more focus for you. Uh, the value add, someone doesn't come on a board as a generalist. People bring certain expertise. That's what a board needs. That's what a board wants. Clearly, things like the, the strategy background, the leadership, those sorts of things are key and essential. So give us a sense, Daria, as you started to think, okay, now I, I have this wonderful career over here. I want to augment that by moving into the board space more intentionally, how you thought about taking that expertise that you bring and where do you find the right opportunities to connect that with in the board space? Sure, sure. Well, you know, certainly there are, there is value to the, as you pointed out, the uh, strategy experience in that realm of working with executive teams, leadership teams, and helping think through, you know, what what is our vision? What is over the horizon? And how do we position ourselves to capture those opportunities? But at the same time, I'll dip back into the earlier uh, experience that I highlighted as an engineer. Um, You know, when you are thinking about board roles, it may not be your front and center uh, executive experience or leadership or strategy experience. It might be some of the more tactical things that your career foundation was rooted on. So, you know, for instance... You know, when I was at Lockheed Martin, I was a system engineer. I was involved in requirements, testing, and verification. And with that, developed a mindset around risk management uh, that, you know, it's interesting. Now operating in this environment as a director is is coming back in in, and paying off in spades. And I think in terms of the the, the role that I have, even though the industry is not aerospace, uh, you know, aerospace or defense contracting, um, that that risk management experience rooted in my engineering background is 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 serving serving well uh, the contributions that I can make. Does that make sense? It does, and there's no question that on every single board you'd want at least one, if not multiple, people focused on risk. And that can look so different depending on the industry you're in. So my prior role, J.P. Morgan, would handle risk in a different way than, say, like a defense contractor would versus a CPG company. But there's no question someone needs that focus. And if any company hadn't been aware of that, I'm sure COVID really brought that to the front and center of we should pay a little bit more time and attention to that. And it's probably interesting to think about someone positioning themselves in their head, okay, I bring, whether it's, you know, IT or risk or supply chain, whatever the, the different experts they bring to bear and thought, okay, this is helpful to a board. So translate that forward, Darius. Okay, great. I have this skill set people definitely need and want. But when we look for a board seat for any of us, we're not just looking for any board seat. We're looking for sort of the right board seat, a place that we know is a good cultural fit that we can add value because that's how our career starts. And if it starts on a good note, more opportunities are likely to come versus if if it's not a successful beginning, it's going to be much more of an uphill battle. How did you think about how I would take that risk background expertise and find the right sort of opportunity? That's a you know that that's a really important point and one that is going to look different for every individual. Uh, for me, um, I, you know what I was uh, what I was trying to assess 
in the opportunities that uh, that I knew might be possible uh, at this stage of, of my career journey. It was it was about re- kind of reverse engineering. What are the needs that they mm-hmm. have, and how do those match what kinds of experiences I'm bringing forward? So, for instance, uh, and it's not any one thing. I think that's an important point to make. You know, it, there is no real silver bullet. You have to think about. I think the the term people use a lot is the value proposition. Well, I would put an S after that. <laughs> it's value proposition. So you're looking for how do my specific skills align with the needs in, in this environment. And so I know I wanted to be in a high growth um, industry uh, and with an organization who was poised to capitalize on that growth. Um, I knew that I wanted to uh, align with a culture that celebrated community focus and community involvement. Um, I knew that I wanted a space where the role of technology would be pivotal in the organization's evolution going forward. And so as I'm saying each of these things, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about, <laughs> you know, what, what were the experiences and areas of expertise that position would position me well to be supportive in each of those areas, high growth, uh, digital transformation or technology evolution, uh, and then also the community commitment. These are pieces of my background that I'm constantly dipping into. Uh, and so it, it's about what is that match for any given person. And I, again, I'm encouraging people not to think about it as a singular element or a, a singular variable, but actually multivariate and, and dynamic in nature as well. That makes so much sense. We talk a lot on the show. There's different terms for it. Let's say a board composition matrix, whatever it might be. And we can all imagine an Excel file with the X and Y axis. One has the board members going across. The other is different sort of backgrounds and skill sets. And no one's going to check just one box. People are going to have multiple boxes that they're checking. And there's lots of different uh, parts of an individual that they bring and add value. And, and Dari, you said one that I really love to dig into here. So, for example, like digital transformation, I think most people can wrap their heads around saying every company in the world is doing something on that. It might be a difference of how in-depth they're going going. But you made a really interesting point here. I'd love if you would describe this more for us. I I think the way I would summarize is how does the corporate board service intersect with community involvement? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, (laughs) there's, there's a literal way. I mean, we, we are in the season of giving right now and and some boards do actively participate in uh, community activities or other forms of giving back. And I think that that can build trust and visibility uh, being part of a community served by an organization. Um, but the, the second way I guess I'll, I'll answer that is, and, and I'm trying to think about how to tie this into this whole element of digital and transformation, and maybe I can do it through this second way. You know, focusing on the word serve and service. So as a board member, you are serving, but, but who or what are you serving? Um, you know, reflect back on the business roundtables push in 2019, shifting away mm-hmm. from uh, shareholder primacy. And we are seeing you know, businesses more explicitly acknowledge their commitment to all stakeholders. So now to tie that a little bit to the idea of digital transformation, you know, your role as a board member is to recognize who the full array of stakeholders are. Let's imagine that's your your staff, right? All layers of your staff. You know, number two, you have to be aware of their needs and interests. So there may be some individuals who, as the organization is digitally transforming and evolving, that do want to upskill and reskill. What and what the board needs to be aware of around that is what is our capacity to support developing people along the lines of their needs and interests. Right. And then the third point, you know, boards have to think about here with respect to who are they serving and, and how they're doing that service is prioritizing how those needs and interests get met as the organization is looking to create long term value. So, uh, you know, I think it, there, there is this whole spectrum here of ways that boards are serving needs, be it the community, literally the community surrounding the organization, but also all the various stakeholders uh, that, that the commitment has to be made to explicitly. 
I like the way you frame that there. And I, I imagine for audience, we can pull this apart in a couple different ways. Certainly, we're seeing, if you want to call it because of the great resignation, right? If you're not meeting the needs of your employees, for example, they're going to let you know that very clearly customers have a choice of who they buy from, assuming supply chain allows them to make that choice, et cetera. Uh, so thinking about the different stakeholder groups, also perhaps industry-based, right? So when I think back to my time at J.P. Morgan, certainly my last role working in the foundation there, we were always thinking about our community and what the value we're adding, sure. certainly the government mandates that for some parts of our business, we have to literally be involved in the community work. And if that's an important part as it was for you, and maybe this is where we get to that the, the bank board that you landed on, right? So you're thinking about some sectors are more focused on community than others. Maybe this is a good transition because I know our audience is going to be very eager to hear, Dari, you've landed your first public company board role, and that is a big deal for a lot of people. We can all talk about getting a board seat, and for some people, a compensated board seat is fine, and a private would be as good as public, but many people are really shooting. I'm not going to have made it till I make a public company board. That's how some people feel right or wrong. <laughs> so you've made it, right? So you've sure. got that public company sure. board seat. Tell us about that process. At some point you said, great, this is what I want to do. And you went and got it. Help us understand sort of your best practice advice, maybe do's and don'ts uh, as it fits in the story. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I love that you, you know, pivoted to this as we were talking about community because uh, you're referencing my role at Columbia Bank, and their tagline actually is "Better Community Banking Starts Here." <laughs> there so, you go. Uh, you know, they have long roots in the in the community. That was a big appeal to me. But if you're looking for, let's you know, retrace steps and think about you know following the breadcrumbs to this opportunity. I would say it, it did start with uh, serving community, and I'll tell you how. Um, the opportunity to get exposure to some of the key members of the leadership team here came from me doing what I just do, uh, which is uh, assisting organizations by means of things like facilitating panel discussions, uh, volunteering at events to, uh, to be a speaker, um, being in front of uh, the room, but in a capacity where it's in support of organizations and their interests. So during one of those events, one of those instances where I was just doing what I would naturally do, uh, as I mentioned, uh, members of the executive team at the bank uh, had an opportunity to see me in action and followed up by exploring uh, you know, who, who this was, <laughs> getting to know me, uh, and that was the start of a lengthy process uh, to to get to know each other, right? And it is a, a two-way street. I think one of the things that people need to be aware of is that this is not you being under the microscope. This is, you know, when you're exploring these opportunities, it is a, uh, you know, an opportunity for it to be a two-way exchange, uh, and and the and a learning process that goes you know on two sides of that equation, right? So um, we do have some agency uh, in the in these interactions that I think it can be empowering for people to recognize. Um, you know, I'd also say if we're talking about some of the specifics here, you know, there were multiple layers of the process in that um, you know meeting with the executive team, meeting with various contingents of the board. In order to to get to know uh, the you know the people who are sitting in the seats, right, and and vice versa, and I think you also have to recognize that that's not just an evaluative piece; it's uh, it's also uh, an opportunity to understand um, how the fit is going to work, right? So uh, they're not just assessing skills and expertise, but you know, is there is there a good alignment between interests and personalities? Uh, and, you know, an opportunity to really work well together. And that due diligence process, if I call it that, is, is essential because both sides need to make sure it's a fit. That's much more likely to yield success. But, of course, this was probably not the typical time of doing it, going through the world of COVID that we have been, right? It might have been a very different look and feel. And I don't think COVID is unfortunately going away anytime soon. So the world of, of the board stuff is changing dramatically. And I imagine your experience could have been a bit different have been before COVID about maybe the speed or the number of people you met in person. So maybe you can give us some thoughts. Perhaps it's, it's sort of takeaways for people in the audience thinking like, I'm going to be going through this process now. It can be a lot harder to meet someone on Zoom and really read the room and understand what's going on. Tell us about your experience as you went through this and perhaps thought you would have as you're looking at the next board role and how you use those to, to make sure it's a success as well. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it, it, this this may, my experience may have kind of 
of defied the norms during COVID. So I don't know that it makes sense to, to really use this as an exemplar because uh, given most people were local, uh, given the uh, some of the safety measures that were in place, we actually were able to meet quite a bit in person, which was fantastic, even despite the fact that it was happening during a period where much of the world was, was shut down. So uh, I, I valued that opportunity to meet safely and connect in that way. But, you know, in terms of advice for people just thinking about going forward and in, in terms of the process, whether it's an unfamiliar or familiar setting, uh, I would say a couple things. You know, have clarity on number one, what you're bringing to the table, um, and and be able to tell that story in a way that is not just compelling, but that's relatable, given uh, who you're sitting across from, right? So looking at ways to connect in that way. I would say number number two, be open to different perspectives. There are going to be ways to ask questions, to raise. Uh, points that you can explore, and you have to you have to show open mindedness to those different perspectives, which is kind of a leading indicator of what you'll need to do when you're in the board seat, right? So you know this this notion of curiosity and humility, intellectual humility. I think it's important to demonstrate that through the process as well. And I think you know maybe the third just general tip I would offer is you know recognize that we are in a very VUCA world, VUCA meaning volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, Mm -hmm. we have to think about scenarios, you know, in terms of how the world will evolve in this environment. And so coming in with some perspectives on how you see the world evolving uh, could also be a big differentiator, independent of what the opportunity is. But thinking about those future, mm, future states of the world, if you will, and how they might impact the future of the organization that you're exploring a relationship with. So, Daria, I love that. And perhaps not surprising, you're basically giving us some good leadership lessons here since you teach us at Wharton. And I know you have some some thoughts on board leadership and what that looks and what it feels like and what a board member is expected to know and what they're not. And you actually have your, your three R's. That, and I would love if you would educate our audience on this. I thought this was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, you know, I like to try to keep things simple. I also love alliteration. <laughs> so when I think about uh, governance, uh, the three R's that come to mind for me are roles, rules, and routines. So roles is, is about the who, right? Who's accountable? Um, what are the, who are the people that are handling various decision-making steps and at what stages? Rules is, is really about consistency. So how can we, from a decision-making standpoint, rely on some, you know, consistent uh, uh, regimens, right, in terms of how we are looking at the future, how we're looking at various scenarios that might arise. Uh, and, and the third is routines. That it deals with the quality of decision-making. So are there repeatable processes? Are there ways that we can rely on approaching decisions such that we know we have a better chance of landing on a quality decision in a timely fashion. And I think, you know, now in in particular that we are dealing with this time of, I think, very unfamiliar territory, highly extreme disruptions to our uh, operating environment in many cases, we have to put ourselves in a position to leverage those three R's to you know, emerge from the period of challenges that we're facing in a more healthy state and and be prepared to seize new opportunities as they surface. And I imagine for some boards, it's just been such a chaotic last year and a half to two years of trying to figure, like, how can I possibly get a hold of this business, put it back where it needs to be? Things are still continuing to change so much. But I guess you're almost laying out a roadmap. Even if you're not there now, this is what you want to be aiming for, perhaps in the in the medium term, to get that in place so the organization can be in a healthy state. Because there there is that fine line between the board's role and the executive's role, who's supposed to be doing That's what. Right. And that has been become a bit murky for some companies during this pandemic. Uh, no, in, indeed. And, you know, in some ways, I, I think you do have to be prepared to pivot when, in that regard when things happen like we've just gone through. There, there is a lot of focus right now on, on what extraordinary risk or existential risk our organization is still facing. And, and those are the kinds of events or incidents that could pull you out of your normal mode of operation, right? Because the impact of not doing so could be devastating. 
you know, despite the low chances that something could happen, when it does, it could have very high consequences. So we have to think about, you know, as directors and in our relationship with management teams, uh, you know, are we positioning ourselves to defend against the things that are most likely to threaten strategy or worse yet, the very survival of the organization? Right. So, uh, you know, and you can look back on this most recent period and say, did we have the right operating cadence? You know, was our decision making approach situated as it needed to be to have agility and accountability. And, you know, and ultimately, are there any other skills and training that we need, you know, in order to make sure that the next time around we're, we're well positioned. Uh, so I, I think this, this is one of those times when it's, it's great to take stock, do a little bit of a postmortem and say, you know, are our rules, routines and roles situated as they need to be, not just from a normal state, but also in the, in the crisis mode situations. Well, Daria, I can tell you're enjoying immensely the the board opportunity in front of you now, and I'm confident this will not be the last organization that approaches you about wanting to be in their board. And and we have many people listening to this show who want the same idea of like, wow, I'd I'd love to be able to pivot my career from just having one or maybe two boards on the side in addition to what I do as an executive to someday I would like to have an entire portfolio of board roles. And this may or may not have crossed your mind yet, but I'd wonder what your thoughts would be for someone who's thinking, okay, I'm going to transition from this to being full-time into the board space and if you, if that were going to be yourself, for example, down the line, how would you go about doing that? Well, you know, this it's a it's a big commitment, right? You know, we we said earlier that that serving in this capacity is about that very thing. It's about service. Uh, and so, when you're considering a, a portfolio career, whether it's a portfolio of all corporate board roles or of other things, we really do have to assess: is this you know, is this aligned with the the ways that I am situated to serve? Uh, so, uh, you know, I think about right now, what is my portfolio? I'm a, I'm a family woman. <laughs> I am a uh, an engaging teacher. I'm a business owner. I am a an adventurer. Uh, I like to dive, uh, and and I'm also a board member. And you know, there I think of it almost like a, on an equalizer on a stereo. You know, you flip mm-hmm. certain things up and down. Um, and, and I think everyone has to think in that same realm of, you know, toggling what kinds of priorities you may focus on at different stages of career of your career based on what your plate can allow and based on what your skills and experiences permit. Uh, so I, I know that I will be continuing to tweak those dials <laughs> as I move forward. And, as, as we uh, all do as the seasons change, right? Yes, that's right. Well, then I would also um, love it. We just sort of talked about the dials maybe related to moving into into a portfolio board member. Maybe we should also talk about it. Maybe the same answer, maybe the dials for someone who is going, I am so inspired by Daria. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to land my first public company board seat. What would be the parting advice you'd have for someone listening to the show today who's got that as their goal? You know, the word that's coming to mind seems a little cliche, but I'll tease it apart a bit. And it's in it's intentionality. Uh, I would say, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do is be clear about why you want to do this. Because deep down, you know, in fact, you might want to even use the, the tool of the five whys to be clear about why you want to do this. Because when that is clear at the root level, you are able to tell your story in a way that will be unique to you, that will be compelling to those on the other side of the table, And that ultimately will ensure you're making the right choice when opportunities, let's hope it's plural, come your way. I love that. Well, Daria, we were delighted to have you on the show today. Thank you for sharing your insights, your success story. And I know you'll have many more to follow on this to help all of us to be boardroom bound. Thank you so much. I've really appreciated the time. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Daria Torres. It was wonderful to hear her pithy insights about how to be successful in the boardroom, such as her her three R's, the rules about the roles, the rules, and routines. Clearly, this is someone with a deep subject matter expertise in strategy and governance and leadership, hearing how she applies those to be successful in the organization and help the companies and her fellow board members to all be at their best. And remember, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you will get links to all of today's resources. 
please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound.